we have one of the most challenging assignments that has ever been given to modern man. The challenge took 12 men from Florida to another world. Zero. All engine running. Umbilical clear. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. And 50 years ago, we took the greatest leap of our time. I'm going to step off the land now. Our quest for the moon transformed Central Florida. We have a mighty big job to do. It changed our perception of time and space. And it drove a new American revolution our founding fathers could have never imagined. For one priceless moment in the whole history of man, all the people on this earth are truly one. But the story of America's space pioneers and the Apollo 11 mission did not play out the way you may think. Beautiful view. Isn't that something? We'll relive it in remastered high definition in this special presentation of Fox 13 News, Man on the Moon, 50 years later. We choose to go to the moon. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Hello, I'm Craig Patrick here at Kennedy Space Center where you can still see equipment from the mission control that took us to the moon and changed the course of history. 50 years ago, the Apollo moon landing helped us defeat a communist empire. It kicked off the computer revolution and made us the envy of the world. But when you look back at what we were up against at the time, it makes the feat far more impressive and much more meaningful here today. The story of our space race starts with a huge problem. This is the first rocket humans ever launched into space. And the problem here is that it was owned and operated by a genocidal maniac. Captured film from Nazi Germany reveals further secrets of the V-2 rocket that blasted England and terrorized her civilians. While the German Nazis developed the world's first supersonic rocket, Adolf Hitler had no interest in exploring craters on the moon. He preferred making his own craters here on Earth. As we closed in on Hitler, we captured some of his top rocket scientists, including V-2 rocket designer Werner von Braun. And our government put him to work designing rockets for the United States. Did you ever have a feeling, wait a minute, this guy's a Nazi, what's he doing here? A lot of people, they, uh, they uh, forgot all about that. Uh, they didn't really forget about it, but here is the man who had to do what he had to do under the Nazi regime. Uh, I think one of the things he said, you know, was uh, you'll do a lot when you have a German Luger pointed at your head, you know. Uh, <laughs> just comment like that. I said, well, yeah. But while some of Hitler's best scientists worked for us, Hitler's other rocket scientists surrendered. Decided to go over to the other side, to Russia. To Joseph Stalin, the other mass murdering dictator of Europe. And Stalin's communist Soviet Union became our new enemy. Soviet troops occupied Eastern Europe. An iron curtain descended across the continent as country after country came under communist domination. It set up a cold war between communism and republican democracy, a controlled collective versus individual freedom. Both sides knew they could win over uncommitted nations by showing how their system was better. And as the new marvel of television swept the world, so beautiful it enhances any decor. That set up the mother of all TV reality shows we called The Space Race. CBS Television presents a special report on Sputnik 1. The, the first round was a shocker. The Soviets launched Sputnik, the first satellite into orbit, while we were still scratching our heads. Right now it's north of Auckland, New Zealand and moving southeast. America was humiliated here and on the verge of panic, not even knowing what Sputnik was even capable of doing up there. Yes, it's quite possible that it's transmitting a code, uh, but we don't uh, realize what the code is. Our military needed to build out a spaceport, and Cape Canaveral, Florida was the logical choice for three reasons. One, space rockets need to veer east to follow the Earth's rotation, and at the Cape, rockets could veer east and then plop into the ocean instead of crashing onto land. Two, the Earth rotates faster in Florida than most of the rest of the nation because it's closer to the equator and that improves rocket flight. And three, this part of Florida was pretty sparse, basically a whole bunch of nothing. The military had already been testing war missiles here because it was one of the safest and most remote places they could find should missiles veer off course and blow up. And by the way, 
happened a lot. Jim Ogle was a rocket inspector, and he remembers how the early models had all the wrong stuff. And you go out and watch it, and it goes up, and boom. <laughs> when we prepared to launch our first satellite, basically a miniature version of Sputnik, and our government invited journalists around the world to witness the feat, the rocket didn't make it four feet off the pad. They called it Flopnik. And once more, the Soviets laughed in our faces. America's prestige had never been lowered. President Dwight Eisenhower, who led the comeback strategy against the Nazis in Europe, devised a new strategy to come back against the communists in space. He created a new agency called NASA to lead civilian research and manage space travel. An Air Force Thor Able One space probe under the management of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration achieved a near perfect takeoff. And within months, NASA rolled out what Hollywood would later call the right stuff. Today we are introducing to you and to the world these seven men who have been selected to begin training for orbital space flight. Step one was Mercury, a one-seat spaceship, and these seven pioneers would take turns flying Mercury capsules in orbit. Once again, the Soviets beat us here, launching their cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin into space first. But when Alan Shepard took America's first manned leap into space, we knew we were closing the gap. And the newly elected president, John F. Kennedy, found the missing piece. We have never specified long-range goals on an urgent time schedule. He realized we were perpetually running a step behind in a race with no time frame or finish line. Three months into office, Kennedy wrote this fateful memo, directing LBJ to work with space and military leaders to figure out the most dramatic feat that we could win whether it's building a space station or maybe flying around the moon. And they came up with something bigger. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. He said no other project could be more impressive to mankind or more important to the long-range exploration of space. And for a nation founded on beating the odds, a goal many thought impossible made all the difference. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Now, for this, we would need a much larger spaceport than what we built at the Cape. In the last 24 hours, we have seen facilities now being created for the greatest and most complex exploration in man's history. Under Kennedy, America started building a new launch complex near Cape Canaveral on Merritt Island that became Kennedy Space Center. We constructed the largest hangar in the world to assemble the largest rocket in the world and a mobile platform to shuttle it to the launch pads. Meanwhile, the Mercury program advanced from sending Alan Shepard into space. to sending John Glenn into orbit. Godspeed, John Glenn. Zero G, and I feel fine. It paved the way for the second space program called the Gemini missions. I feel like a million dollars. I'm a good guy. Gemini carried two astronauts. Its goal was to teach astronauts how to work and maneuver in space. This is astronaut Ed White taking America's first walk through space on Gemini 4. These missions prepared the astronauts for all the things they'd have to do to get to the moon. Ignition. Lift off. But the Gemini 8 mission to link two spacecraft in orbit could have been a disaster. The control system failed and sent it spinning out of control until a quick thinking commander named Neil Armstrong saved the ship and crew. NASA then moved into the Apollo missions. This is the three-seater spacecraft to the moon. But Apollo 1, never got off the ground. Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee were doing a mock countdown and a module with poor wiring that was filled with flammable components. Apollo electronics engineer Ken Poinbooth says a lot of stuff went wrong. And in fact, we were in a 100% oxygen rich environment, which is a no-no, you don't do that because it makes everything volatile. A fire, in the a fire broke out and the pressure from the fire sealed the escape hatch and killed all three in the inferno. And I, even today, cry when I, when I see them on, on film. 
This was America's low point in the space race, and it grounded Apollo. Bob Seek served on the launch team, and at this point, the rebuilding team. There's shock, there's grief, and, and then, particularly as an engineer, it was, you become part of the effort to determine what went wrong. NASA redesigned the capsule. Two, we have ignition. And a man crew took Apollo 7 on a test flight around Earth. This is flight control. We have the power. Oh, come in. Then they perfected the massive Saturn V rocket. We were back on our feet. But satellite spy pictures showed the Soviets were closing in on their moonshot. So instead of the planned test flight around Earth, the engines are on. Four, three, two, one. Zero. Apollo 8 skipped a few steps and just took off to the moon. What did you think when you heard that? Whoa, wait a minute now. Let's think about this. Is this the right move? Is this the right step? It worked. Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders traveled nearly 250,000 miles. And on Christmas Eve 1968, they transmitted live video as they flew laps around the moon, read from the book of Genesis, and mesmerized the world. We close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. And as they snapped pictures of the moon's surface to scout future landing sites, Anders looked up and had the aha moment of his life. Oh my God, look at that picture over there. There's the earth coming up. Wow, is that pretty? Hey, don't take that from schedule. He broke from the script and caught the earth rise the image of the century. Take several, take several up here. Give me Wait a minute, let me just get the right setting here. Calm, calm down, Bubba. Apollo 9 tested the new lunar module in space. Apollo 10 was the full dress rehearsal. Then it was time for Apollo 11 to close the deal. NASA picked Gemini 8 hero Neil Armstrong to command, Buzz Aldrin to pilot the lunar module, and Michael Collins to pilot the command module. Astronauts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and then finally Mike Collins. A million people poured into Central Florida. 20 seconds and counting. Former President Johnson joined 200 congressmen and more than 3,000 journalists from 56 nations. Up to 600 million others watched the live broadcast around the world. 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start. July 16, 1969, 9.32 a.m. 6. Five, four. This was it. One, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower clear. 11 Houston thrusters go. All engines, you're looking good. We just launched the boldest trip in human history, but the crew still had four days to get to the moon. You've got three more steps and then a long one. Coming up, we'll share the surprises and often untold stories of the first moon landing and map out the discoveries and breakthroughs along the way. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. There's a shot from the stands as Apollo 11 takes off for the moon. You see Vice President Spiro Agnew and former President Lyndon Johnson side by side, adversaries united, a metaphor of things to come. And look at the pride and awe on the faces around them. We're now around 30 seconds after liftoff. Plus 30 seconds. And there's a shot in the firing room moments after the Apollo 11 blasted off. You see the engineers turning from their stations, looking out the window. And Jim Ogle, you were one of them. Take me back to that moment in time. I'm, I'm speechless. I, I mean, you, you can't, uh, I, I don't have the words for it. The excitement of the moment, but as you mature and you look back on that moment, it even becomes more significant because, holy mackerel, we really did something here. This country. The engineers in mission control were young that day. Average age was 26. Apollo 11 flight director Gene Cran said he was the oldest that day, a month shy of his 36th birthday. And in that sea of young men, Joanne Morgan was the trailblazer. I just happened to like solving problems. The Space Center's first female engineer. 
I was used to being the only woman in the room. The number one thing is do your job, get your work done. The three astronauts were in their late 30s. Neil Armstrong earned a salary of $30,000 a year, Buzz Aldrin, $18,000, Michael Collins, $17,000. That's good money, the equivalent to six-figure salaries today when you adjust for inflation. But they could not afford life insurance given their line of work. So before they took off, they signed and left behind hundreds of postcards and asked friends to postmark them July 20th so their loved ones could sell them and get something if they did not come home. But that is not what Armstrong told his two little boys before he left. He said, you know, we're confident we're coming back. You know, there is some risk. We don't know if we're going to land on the moon, you know, 50-50 chance, you know, if everything is going to work right. Uh, but we're, we, we're coming back. President Nixon stayed in Washington with Apollo 8 Commander Frank Borman at his side to tell him what was happening each step of the way. When the astronauts were halfway to the moon, the White House wrote this speech for President Nixon in case the astronauts get stuck on the moon. It reads, fate has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. Dominion del cosmo, noi dobbiamo non dimenticare. People around the world were praying. So friends and neighbors, relatives, they would come by sort of at any bring hour, food, yeah. bring food over, talk, chat, uh, and, Run you know, errands in, when mom in, couldn't do in it. In retrospect, yeah, um, console, you know, support. mom. Support, and, support you know, mom. System. Meanwhile, the four-day run through space was quite stressful in other ways. It requires precise steps and maneuvers and cramped and putrid conditions. Collins described the smell in the module as a mix of wet dog and swamp gas. You can see why they would want to freshen up before the big night. Roger, the burn was on time. Their spaceship hooked into the moon's orbit July 20th. That alone required calculations and maneuvers that scientists likened to shooting at a moving target from a spinning teacup. And remember, the army of young engineers worked the calculations without computers as we know them today. We have more computing power in our smartphones than you did at the early days of the space race. I saw people working off of slide rules yes. in the beginning. Yeah, it was simple. But, but as the old chief engineer that first briefed us new engineers when we came on board in the early 60s, it's, it's just high school physics. The Apollo 11 crew had a primitive push dial computer, the world's first digital computer designed specifically for them. We can figure out how to do anything we just need the sustained commitment to say, go do it. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin did it by undocking the lunar module called the Eagle from the mothership. Michael Collins stayed behind to run the command module. He was their ticket home. Houston, you're a go for landing, over. I remember almost every word said during the descent while we were in mission control. There was a lot of tension because we were having a lot of problems. The first problem as they were coming down at 3,000 miles per hour. Their signal back to Earth kept cutting out. Eagle, we got you now. It's looking good, over. Then the computer kept sounding the same type of alarm. Bobo 2, program alarm. The computer was overwhelmed. Roger, Bobo 1, Bobo 1. So they decided to ignore it. We're go, same type, we're go. Here's what they saw out the window on the left side of the screen with the reconstructed panorama on the right side of the screen. They noticed the computer was steering them toward a boulder zone or the side of a crater. Armstrong had to take over manual control just as he did on Gemini 8, look out the window and try to find a smooth place to land. 100 feet, three and a half down. And that's when the fuel light came on because they were running on fumes. Uh, Houston was biting their nails at the time because they're counting down the seconds of fuel left for that engine that's hovering them over for a landing site. They landed in a flat, dusty field we call the Sea of Tranquility. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. I probably came really close to crying during that time. Close. Uh, yeah. Well, you didn't actually tear I up? I don't know. I probably did. <laughs> I probably teared up. You're looking good here. Okay, we're going to be busy for a minute. And wait till you see what happened when they walked on the moon. And what they didn't tell us about that night that we now know 50 years later.
altitude's two miles. July 16th, 1969. There's the Apollo 11 blasting off toward the moon. And here's a look at the backside of the massive Saturn V rockets that took the Apollo crews to the moon. The Apollo 11 crew did spend four days en route to the moon. And when they finally arrived, 600 million people across Earth could not believe what they were seeing live on their television sets. And they couldn't even see the most interesting parts until now. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Neil Armstrong, being the ace pilot that he was, landed so gently, it did not compress the legs of the module. He had to jump down the ladder, making this more of a leap than they had planned. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Buzz Aldrin followed. You've got three more steps and then a long one. While you can see Armstrong now collecting moon dust, off camera, Aldrin, a Presbyterian elder, took the first communion on the moon. Off camera, because NASA was already facing a complaint for mixing church and state when Apollo 8 read from Genesis. The serpents appeared to be uh, very, very fine-grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. That fine powder made it easy for Aldrin to make that iconic boot print on the moon. But as you'll see here, it also made it kind of tricky to plant the first American flag. They also planted laser reflectors that we still use to measure the distance between the Earth and Moon, which, by the way, confirms the Moon is slowly drifting away from us. But this night is the night that pulled the people of Earth closer together. Hello, Neil and Buzz. Nixon touched on that in his call to the astronauts from the Oval Office. Because of what you have done, the heavens have become a part of man's world. And as you talk to us from the Sea of Tranquility, it inspires us to redouble our efforts to bring peace and tranquility to Earth. Of course, we also beat the Soviet Union this night, and this feat may have hastened its demise. It certainly paved the way for global cooperation in space, a point Armstrong stressed in one of his final speeches before he died. Ideological differences fade in the presence of the overpowering force of pride in what we do and what Americans have achieved. And this first night on the moon fueled America's imagination and determination to do so much more. I would go out at night and look up at the moon, I'd say, I can't believe we're there. And kids who watched this night live became the next generation of dreamers and leaders in space. What the adults were saying, it sounded to me like this was important. They told me it was. They said, don't ever forget this. Dr. Phil Metzger grew up to become an engineer for the future space shuttle and International Space Station. I knew that something big was happening, something that would be remembered for the ages. Charlie Blackwell Thompson was also captivated by Apollo 11. Because I remember as a first grader, them bringing in the black and white TV in my classroom uh, and us all gathering around. She became a successor to Jean Kranz. Now she's the launch director in this same firing room, picking up where the age of Apollo left off. It doesn't matter how many people are in this room. It's incredibly quiet. It's louder in here right now than it is on launch day. Uh, Roger, we've got you four-sided, but uh, back to the one side. Before they left, Neil and Buzz placed the first memorial on another world. They left a gold replica of an olive branch and a mission patch from Apollo 1 to honor fallen astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. And medals to fallen cosmonauts Vladimir Komarov and Yuri Gagarin, who died in Soviet air disasters before we reached the moon. And then Buzz Aldrin got the call to come back a bit sooner than he or anyone in his shoes may have liked. It's disappointing to go someplace so far away when you've been thinking about it and then somebody says, you gotta come home. And that brings us to one last problem that could have stranded them. The switch to launch the lunar module back to the command ship had broken off the panel. Aldrin found a writing pen in the pocket of his spacesuit and in a real-life MacGyver moment, he plugged it into the circuit breaker and turned it into a switch. Here's how the lunar module looks when it blasts off to the mothership. This is actually from Apollo 17. 
Ten other Americans will follow in Neil and Buzz's footsteps with greater breakthroughs down the road. When we won the race to the moon, it paid off in ways the astronauts weren't even thinking about. We'll show you how the Apollo mission set the stage for staggering discoveries and striking changes for Central Florida yet to come. I was strolling on the moon one day in a very, very month of December. That's Harrison Schmidt and Eugene Cernan frolicking on the moon. Ten astronauts would follow Neil and Buzz's first expedition. And as Florida launched all of them, they in turn launched Florida. The towers of Canaveral give Florida a unique place in the history of man. The state government produced this film back in the early 1960s. Look at this, back when three and a half bucks would get you 12 gallons of gas. And back when the space race ramped up, and Florida took off. Brevard County, site of Cape Canaveral, is the fastest growing county in the United States, more than tripling in 10 years. That was just the first spurt before Kennedy ordered the moonshot, before our government bought another 219 square miles of marsh and turned it into a sprawling space factory. And on the land will be built facilities of such tremendous size and complexity as to stagger the imagination. They called it the Launch Operations Center, then renamed it Kennedy Space Center. They'd ship sections of the Saturn V rockets on barges, assemble the rockets and vehicles in the aptly named Vehicle Assembly Building, stack them on mobile transporters and crawl them to the launch pads. And today we are here to celebrate a very historic era in American history. For the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, NASA gave us a tour behind the scenes from inside the Vehicle Assembly Building that's 526 feet tall to launch pads 39A and B where the Apollo missions took off to the firing room, to recovery operations, and places in between. Here's an up-close look at the crawler that carried the massive Saturn V rockets from the Vehicle Assembly Building all the way to the launch pad. This was built in 1965, went into operation in 1966, and one of the most striking things about it is that this is still in operation here today. There's many things you can touch right here that are from the early 60s. It's the maintenance. Nobody's going to give us the money to get another one right now, not in these days and age and time. By that, he means NASA now has a mostly fixed budget that's a much smaller slice of the budget compared to the early days. The space race gave Florida back then a sudden jolt in wealth and a flood of development and jobs. Housing was, construction was everywhere. And so it was really, really, really exciting times. And these were comparatively high paying jobs that drew a mass influx of highly educated and young families to central Florida. The area around the Cape suddenly had the highest concentration of doctoral degrees in the nation. It drew clusters of defense contractors, research labs, and electronics factories. And as the government started building Interstate 4 to link the Space Coast to Tampa, it spread rapidly west. Tampa is on the I-4 corridor. This corridor is a center of high technology development in Florida. Phil Metzger's dad moved to Florida to work on the space race, and like so many others, he followed in this old man's footsteps. And so it was, it was sort of like um, a fish doesn't notice the water that it swims in. I, I just thought that was the way life is. People work on the space program. It also drove waves of tourists to watch the launches and it launched the clusters of motels, mainly space-themed, from the Starlight to the Sea Missile in Polaris to a brand new town called Satellite Beach. And have you noticed many of the homes from Tampa Bay to Titusville were built in the 50s and 60s? That was during the space rush. And that rush created demand for groceries, which fueled a chain based in Jacksonville called Winn-Dixie and another grocer based in Lakeland that would become a retail giant. Similar growth has been experienced by public after NASA built out Kennedy Space Center, there were rumors it had scooped up another 39 square miles west of Orlando. But that wasn't NASA. It was Walt Disney. That the Disney World is located just a few miles from the crossing point of Interstate 4 and Sunshine State Parkway. 
He knew all these growing young families with such buying power, and the throngs of tourists created an untapped frontier for family entertainment. The rest is history, including a certain mountain of tomorrow that seemed to fit in with the times. It all created more demand for Florida, which built out Central Florida as the hub of technology, aerospace, space development, and entertainment that we know today. Now more than 20,000 people work in the aerospace industry just in the Tampa Bay area. And those numbers will surge yet again, because 50 years after our first night on the moon, NASA is accelerating its plans to fly back to the moon and then take a much greater leap. Oh, the space race that molded Florida changed quite a bit after the Apollo era. It delivered a mix of breakthroughs and failures. And now we're taking the path from Apollo to the next giant leap. Well, NASA preserved much of the mission control from the old Apollo missions, but of course technology changed a lot through the years. And so did NASA's goals and missions and our nation's priorities. Apollo 11 captivated the world, but people started losing interest in the moon missions to follow. Apollo 13. Apollo 13 was the exception because an oxygen tank blew up on their way to the moon and crippled the ship in deep space. Okay, yes, sir, we've had a problem here. The world was gripped by the peril and the miraculous feat of returning them safely to Earth after a terrible accident. And welcome home. Thank you. That's not what NASA was going for. Even before Apollo 11, it started developing a secret plan to build a new kind of spaceship. NASA submitted it to Congress while we were still sending men to the moon on Apollo. Okay, here we go, a big one. Off the ground, on the floor. That's Apollo 16 commander John Young saluting the flag on the moon and learning of big news back on Earth. This looks like a good time for some good news here. The house passed uh, the space budget gets to 277 to 60, which includes a vote for the shuttle. America scrapped the moon missions in favor of a reusable shuttle that would only reach low Earth orbit. NASA named the prototype the Enterprise, after Captain Kirk's famous spaceship on TV. The first one to actually blast off was named Columbia. Minus 10, 9, 8, And Apollo 7. 16 commander John Young took the helm. We have made it. America built a fleet of these shuttles that launched a network of satellites that fueled the GPS and smartphone revolution. We went ahead and uh, threw the switch and sent Magellan on its way. Shuttle Atlantis launched the Magellan probe, which revealed how Venus is choked in greenhouse gas and how Earth could face the same deadly fate. Atlantis also launched the Galileo probe that discovered the first moon to orbit an asteroid. And it found evidence of an ocean on Jupiter's moon Europa and salt water on the moons of Callisto and Ganymede, and with it, the growing potential for extraterrestrial life. When people ask me, do I think there's other possible life out there? I say, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, are we it? What a waste. Milt Heflin was an Apollo recovery engineer who served as flight director on the Shuttle Endeavour's mission to fix the Hubble telescope. That gave us new insight into how the universe started and where it's going. Thousands of galaxies in that one picture, and I'm thinking to myself, holy Toledo. Then Atlantis launched the Gamma Ray Observatory, and Columbia launched the Chandra X-ray Observatory. They revealed dark matter and galaxies giving birth. And then the shuttles launched the International Space Station that gave former Cold War enemies a place to work together. But along the way, tragedy struck twice. Challenger, go and throttle up. In 1986, a leaky booster ring on Shuttle Challenger spewed hot gas on the external fuel tank. It exploded and killed the crew of seven. Then, in 2003, foam debris damaged Columbia's heat shield on takeoff, and it disintegrated on re-entry, again killing a crew of seven. The Columbia disaster revealed a flaw they could not completely fix. And I think we learned from the shuttle that that's not quite the right way of going about it. Oh, and lift off, the final lift off of Atlantis on the shoulders of the space shuttle, America will continue the dream. President George W. Bush gave the order to phase out the space shuttle. 
President Obama saw it through in 2011, and the economy around Florida's Space Coast tanked. Well, there was a lot of, lot of foreclosures, a lot of homes that were left. You know, the jobs were hard for anybody to find. Mike Grumbly said it was the glory days of Apollo in reverse. It was, it was terrible. Shops closed, and many of the same families who helped us win the race to the moon raced to leave the towns they built. Titusville took the hardest hit. That they'd go in and look at them and they'd still, the refrigerators would still be running with food in them and that people would be gone. Mike Grumbly, who buys and sells collectibles, got flooded with people shedding keepsakes that you would expect to see in a museum. You know, a lot of the stuff in the Mercury program, like the float balls that went inside the capsules. Just across town, you'll find a lot of priceless relics in the American Space Museum like this medallion honoring shuttle pioneer Joseph P. Allen. When he was inducted into the Astronaut Hall of Fame. Guess where they got it? A person found it in a garage sale, purchased it, and then chose to send it to the museum so that we could have it. In hard times, or as families move on, this is what you get. Uh, two young students getting ready to go to college went to the Salvation Army here in Titusville, and they found three light blue shuttle launch suits worth at least a thousand dollars a piece and they paid like nickels and dimes for all three of them liftoff we have a liftoff well, titusville also took a hit when nasa phased out apollo but back then they had the shuttle program waiting in the wings this time communities around the space coast cratered because they scaled back the budget and pulled the plug on the shuttle program with no glide path to something else. A nation that beat the Soviets to the moon now relies on the Russians to get a taxi into space. Yeah, but I think part of it is a symptom of the fact that NASA has a pretty well fixed budget. So if NASA wants to end one program and begin another program, they can't really overlap the programs. They have to bring one to an end before they can start the next. That brings us now to the next big thing that's already bringing Titusville back to life. We have two game changers that are driving a new space race. One of them leads to some intriguing revelations about the moon. There are some things the Apollo astronauts did not get to see on the moon that turns out are pretty important. And now our science and space leaders say we have to go back to the moon, this time to stay. We'll break down the plans and what they mean for Central Florida coming up. Setting up the flag now. 50 years ago, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin just scratched the surface of the moon. We now know much of the moon does not look anything like the Sea of Tranquility. For starters, it gets bombarded with cosmic bullets that melt, splatter, and freeze. So the surface of the moon is coated with something like 50% glass, little sharp shards. After the Apollo missions, a lot of people thought it was just a dead, dusty, static rock. We have payload for jettison. But the probes we sent years after Apollo reveal the changes within. For example, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter showed us how the moon has been shrinking and appears to still be contracting. And now that we've had 50 years to bounce lasers off the reflectors that Neil and Buzz planted on the surface, we see the moon is also speeding up and spiraling away. Eventually, the moon will be so far away from the Earth that we'll have to say it's a double planet system. And here's the bombshell. In 2008 and in 2009, NASA made some significant discoveries, namely that there's hundreds of millions of tons of water ice on the surface of the moon. When those cosmic bullets strike the surface, they don't just form those shards of glass. They strike the moist soil below and release bursts of water. Turns out the moon is loaded with ice that bursts into water, sort of like the water on Earth, because we now know the moon is actually a broken off chunk of ancient Earth. And below a thin, dusty surface, it locked in banks of moon water, especially on the South Pole. Those green dots mark the mother load that may change the course of history yet again. It's water to, to, to drink, it's air to breathe, but hydrogen and oxygen is also rocket fuel. You can do that very easily by electrolyzing the water to make hydrogen and oxygen. In space, you will get the energy to electrolyze it from solar energy. And when you burn the fuel together, the mass 
is, is steam. It creates steam as it burns, and you're shooting steam out the back, back of your rocket. It's the ticket for manned missions to Mars, mining colonies on the moon, and even power stations for us. We can create gigantic antennas that are capable of transmitting far more data than anything you could launch on a rocket. Once you've got that, you can do amazing things. You can control all the asteroids to make life safe on the Earth. You can build energy systems to beam clean energy to the Earth, all the energy we want at lower cost than anything else that's available today. But remember, we did not claim and do not own any of this. The resources on the moon are sort of first come, first serve, and other nations now have their sights on reaching the moon too. You can see where this story is going from the one that played out 50 years ago. We'll map out the specific plans and deadlines for America's second race to the moon, and we'll show you how it could launch Florida yet again from the days of Apollo to the new age of Artemis. After we abandoned the moon, scientists then discovered loads of ice and potential rocket fuel just beneath the dusty surface. So now we're heading back to the moon with plans to build mining colonies and a launch pad to Mars. Two, one, and liftoff at dawn. The dawn of Orion and a new era of American space exploration. Five years ago, we covered and we witnessed the fateful test flight of Orion. Good engine control on the first stage. This was the turning point that's now leading back to the moon and the new program named after Apollo's twin sister, Artemis. Three, two, one, fire. NASA's testing a new heavy rocket called the SLS that will blast Orion to the moon on the iconic launch pad 39B. So Artemis will take off from this very spot. This very spot. I know I'm going to have a lot of tears. I'm going to have an incredible amount of pride in what the team has accomplished. Back at the assembly building, engineers have bolstered the mobile transporters to handle the extra weight and, by the way, figured the new fuel economy for the crawlers. Actually, it's 32 feet per gallon. 32, 32 feet per gallon, feet. which is actually pretty good considering it's hauling, what, 24 million pounds? Including the weight of the crawler, we're talking 24 million pounds. Meanwhile, NASA plans to build sort of a rest stop in lunar orbit called Gateway. Here, astronauts can dock the Orion, steer Gateway to the South Pole, and then hop on a lunar lander to the ice loads. Look at this, they're already testing mining robots that can burr into the lunar soil and break out chunks of ice. Instead of purchasing, owning, and operating all of the hardware, we're gonna buy services. And then we'll start in. And that's where the billionaires enter the picture. Jeff Bezos, Blue Origin, and Elon Musk, SpaceX are leading private enterprise into space. They're bringing down launch costs, taking care of business in low Earth orbit, and developing innovations like the SpaceX rockets that can blast off then land right back in place to be reused again at the same time. This is a new type of satellite that is really small. Labs at universities across Florida are buzzing. We're 3D printing the initial box to go use to, uh, to test things out. With experiments to help design the next generation of moon craft. The lasers are going to go shoot through the dust cloud as a lander lands. These UCF researchers at the Florida Space Institute are also producing synthetic moon dust and studying how it behaves in low gravity to figure out how to build stuff on it. So if, if you were to put like a bunch of this stuff on Earth, due to gravity is automatically behaving differently when you start building on it than it would on the moon. For NASA, the timetable is to land a man and woman on the moon by 2024, launch a sustained human presence by 2028, then in the years to come, harness solar energy and convert moon water into hydrogen fuel, maybe even beaming nuclear power nearly 250,000 miles away. Or there's the possibility of nuclear power. A nuclear reactor on the moon. You know, the Mars Curiosity ro rover is powered by a, by a nuclear power source. Um, so this is something that's been done, the technology exists, it's just a, a matter of scaling it up. So we have some bold goals here that may sound impossible, but remember, Kennedy's goal of landing a man on the moon also sounded impossible, and within eight years, we actually did it. Now NASA says we'll be back on the moon within five years, and our greatest leaps 
still lie ahead. Thank you for watching.